what is the limit of what the military can do and what where the others should be engaged and who should be engaged. Well, I think there's where are the, mil the limits of the military to achieve something? I think there are huge limits to what any military can achieve. You know, there's sort of an old saying uh, in the U.S. is that when you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And so I think if you look today, you know, the way the U.S., which has, you know, could be argued the strongest military in the world, the way the U.S. projects its power internationally is frequently through that military. And there are very few tools that the U.S. government has to use aside from its military. You know, the like, diplomatic tools or even cultural tools and exchanges. So I think one of the negative things that's going on in the U.S. right now is that the way the U.S. is projected abroad is mainly through its military. Now you are based in Istanbul and mm -hmm. you following the, uh, the war against ISIS, the war in Syria and Iraq. What is also the big uh, misunderstanding about this particular war? Because these days there is a lot of exaggeration. You know, mm -hmm. there was a time, I mean, said about Iraq, then something about Syria, then again nothing in the news more or less, and now there is this big fight of ISIS as if it's the biggest, I don't know, battle of the man mankind against the barbarians. So what do you see we know and what we don't understand about this particular conflict and how big this danger is as well? No, I think sometimes the way that conflict is presented is that it is something new, that the Islamic State is some brand new entity, something we've never seen before, but if you really look it's an extension of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which came about after the U.S. invasion in 2003. So the war there, at least with the Islamic State, has been occurring uninterrupted um, you know, for the last 12 years. Um, but you know, furthermore, I think what's going on, whether it's the Syrian civil war or the war in Iraq, is, you know, or any of the, you know, and any of what we're seeing in the so-called Arab Spring countries, you know, it's really there's an existential crisis in the Middle East right now for what the future of that region is going to look like, whether it will be something more progressive or whether or not it will be something a little bit more regressive, you know, it will be a, uh, will it be a strand of Islam that kind of you know, looks forward or one that looks back to the time of the Prophet, you know, this is, this is what people are fighting about there and I think it is a existential conflict that's as profound you know, as, as some of the restructuring that took place in Europe in the 20th century. Uh, but really, who's fighting who? That's everybody's confused. Yeah, how much time do we have for this interview? <laughs> I mean, the, you know, you have, I mean, you have, it's, it's very confusing. I think it's very confusing for people at home to understand. I mean, you have the Islamic State that is fighting um, Assad, but they're also fighting the United States. You have the you have Assad who is fighting the Islamic radicals like the Islamic State or groups like Jabhat al-Nusra, um, but they're also fighting the Free Syrian Army. You know, it's a game where the sides are constantly changing, and that's why it makes any type of foreign intervention seem almost impossible. And what the Islamic State State is, from somebody who had fought in Fallujah, who had been in Iraq, and now currently working on the you know Turkish Syrian border. What is that? What is the Islamic yeah. State? I mean, is, I mean, I mean, we're following, but like, how to explain for somebody who probably know better? You know, I can maybe tell you a story. I remember the first time I went down to the Syrian border was in uh, late summer of 2013, and I was standing across uh, from a Syrian city called Azaz, and there was uh, fighting in Azaz, and we could see the mortar rounds landing and the smoke coming up from the city. And the people I was with said, you know, the Islamists are fighting the Free Syrian Army in Azaz. And everybody was very confused. Why would the Islamists be fighting the Free Syrian Army? It sounds silly to say it now that we've seen how the conflict has evolved, but they were fighting the Free Syrian Army because the Islamic State, which was the group that was actually fighting, was trying to take that city and create an Islamic State. But that was a very new idea at the time because back then everyone thought that you had Islamist rebels and you had secular rebels, but they were all fighting the uh, all fighting the regime. So the conflict and the revolution in Syria has really shifted to one in its early days was about uh, liberal, democratic-minded reforms, uh, and one where you know people took to the streets chanting, you know, one, 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 the Syrian people are one, to one that's become increasingly sectarian to one that's become about you know, the goals of the Islamic State to establish this caliphate. So the war as it's gone on has continued to sort of morph and take on different shapes and will probably continue to do so. And, but who are these people? You know, and what is new about that? I, or is there anything new about the Islamic State, state if you compare even to Taliban and the other things? Because these guys also are using like all the modern technologies, mm -hmm. you know, they, at the same time fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. No, but well, it's an interesting question. Like, what's new about the Islamic State? Because in many ways, what they pride themselves on is is espousing this ideology and this vision that is not new, that is very, very old, that goes back to you know the times of the Prophet Muhammad. So, um, in many ways, 
it's almost a regressive type of warfare. You know, this idea of establishing a caliphate in the under Sharia law, something that's very similar to what existed a thousand years ago, but it's relying on new technology to spread its message. And I think we've seen that done with great effect, whether it's, you know, posting videos online of uh, headings to YouTube or recruiting over Twitter. It's uh, really, those mediums have really allowed them to expand their reach. And the fact that, the fact that a few people from the Islamic State can behead a journalist in the Syrian desert, post that video on YouTube, and it changes the foreign policy of an entire country is pretty profound. Uh, but really, how mighty they are. And now I s talk to you as a former military and somebody who write about that because if you really look now on what the politicians say either in the US or in Europe it's like they saw it looks like the ISIS is so mighty right you know uh, but you've seen the all the different kinds of militia in mm -hmm. in the in the region in in the Middle East in the Arab countries in Afghanistan sure. so are they so mighty that nobody can fight them no I mean I was you know I was up um, outside of Erbil in northern Iraq uh, this is past November, so about nine months ago, and we took a visit up to the front line with the Kurdish Peshmerga. And so uh, after traveling a long ways, we get up to the front line, and the front line position was basically eight Peshmerga fighters with one old rusted PKM machine gun staring across about a kilometer of desert. And you know, we looked through the binoculars and we could see the positions of the Islamic State. And these Peshmerga asked us, you know, where are our guns from the United States? You know, where, where are the airplanes? But this was the front line. And I remember talking to their commander, and they were defending a small town called Makmur, and the Islamic State had, had taken from them, and that they had been retaken a few weeks before. And I asked him, I said, well, how many men did the Islamic State take Makmur with? They said, oh, they came in here with six Humvees, which are trucks. I said, only six? He said, yeah, they came in with six, and we pushed them out. You know, and those are very small numbers. But that's not really what is important. And when you say how strong someone is, they might be very, very strong with very small numbers. I mean, one of the reasons the Islamic State is so strong right now is because you know, there isn't there isn't much international will to get involved in another war in Syria, in Iraq or even in Syria across the border. And so, if there is no international will, um, the only thing that matters is who's the strongest in the moment. And right now, they are, and that's why they're able to uh, to dictate policy. Something um, I'm very curious, and we are uh, recently the Russia like officially recognized and sent mm -hmm. they're, they're sending the troops to Syria. They don't have the Russian troops don't have that, that kind of obligation, at least informally. They don't mm -hmm. care that much about the public opinion back at home. Uh, so, how do you think it would? Uh, change the the conflict itself uh, and we also understand that the Russian president is going to the UN and would kind of and that's what I understand to build in the strategy of the the image of the peacemaker who would come and save the world from ISIS at least that's what is also discussed do you think there is any sense of that and what could be the the, the Russian role in that you know I think it's very difficult because what we're talking about is wars by proxy you know my country the United States is fighting a proxy war in Syria, in Iraq, um, Russia is fighting a proxy war, and the Iranians are fighting a proxy war in Syria. And, you know, and ultimately, those wars by proxy, the people they really end terribly for, are the people whose country that is, and that's the Syrian people. You know, we've seen, you know, obviously, there's an enormous refugee crisis that only now is getting a lot of media attention.